right, everybody, welcome to the Brave New World of the Proceedings Podcast. We're now doing a video stream along with our audio broadcast. So you will be seeing episodes on the Naval Institute YouTube channel, as well as the normal place where you've gotten the Proceedings Podcast for 245 episodes. So, Bill, welcome to the world where you can see us as well as hear us. Crazy. No, it's great to be here. But, it is great to be here. You know, we started this thing uh, about five years, not even five years ago, four years ago, off the side of our desk, just audio only. And now we're entering the video sphere. So, always so if you're on YouTube, if you're a YouTube type of person, uh, this is where you can get the podcast from here on out. And if you're a person who is listening to us in the car or whatever, nothing will change in terms of how you get the shows aggregated into your queue or whatever. And so uh, fear not. This is just what we call a value add. And we wanted to uh, try to, as we've described before on the show, we're, we're, we're trying to do more with our YouTube channel. Um, and, and this is this is one way. And we'll figure out how to use the functionality of the video medium uh, as we go forward here as well. But for now, it'll just be us and our guest talking. So Bill, what's happening? I know that we have some cool things in the December issue coming up. Yeah, the, the team and I, we just put the finishing touches on the December proceedings today. So it's off to the printers. A lot of people ask, do we print the, the magazine in-house? We don't. It goes to uh, a company outside of Chicago where they print it and put it into the U.S. mail. So it gets to uh, people's mailboxes about the 1st of December. We post it online. But uh, the, the main topic of conversation in the issue is really focused around the ongoing debate and discussion of forward presence versus readiness and how the Navy has been struggling for quite some time uh, with that topic, with that problem. Uh, and a lot was made of that, of that topic and, and uh, you know, the manifestation of that problem in the, uh, the 2017 surface warfare, surface uh, Navy collisions out near Japan. Um, and so the, the lead article, if you will, in the, the, the one that is the, the, probably the most eye-catching for readers, I think, uh, is part of the American Sea Power Project. Uh, Bob Work, the Honorable Secretary Bob Work, our chair of our board, former Deputy uh, Secretary of Defense, former Undersecretary of the Navy. Uh, his article is titled, A Slavish Devotion to forward presence nearly broke the U.S. Navy. Uh, so digest that for a minute. So the former undersecretary of the Navy, or, or Navy and, and Dep SecDef, um, writing that uh, you know this slavish devotion to presence uh, has broken the Navy, or has or has nearly broken the Navy. And it's a it's a fantastic article. I give uh, Secretary Work huge credit for walking the dog. Right. So he's gone back and looked at things like. Where, where was the Navy after World War II? And what were the, the sort of foundational writings and thinking about how to make the value proposition to the US taxpayer for why we continue to need a Navy in the aftermath of World War II when we destroyed all comers, right? When there was you know the, the victory to end all victories almost, right? At, at sea at least. And uh, so he references the Samuel Huntington 1954 proceedings article, the Transoceanic Navy, and then he references the, the post-Cold War efforts where the Navy wrote, you know, from the sea, and then there was forward from the sea, and then there was the cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power, and on and on. And um, you can see, and, and, and work just does this masterful job of, uh, the, you know, laying out the lineage of where forward presence went from something that the Navy did, one of the many things, important things, missions of the Navy, to in, in current day becoming the thing that the Navy did, you know, that forward presence is the Navy. And, you know, as that transformation happened philosophically over time, you see things where ships get underway because they have to meet the mission, which is forward presence, but they're not really ready, right? And so there was that readiness problem. Then all that came out in the strategic readiness, readiness review, the comprehensive review uh, post-2017. And uh, uh, anyway, work did a great job. But with that, and it's often interesting to see how the, the puzzle pieces fit together in a particular issue of proceedings, 
We have a, a piece by a J.O. named Lieutenant Jeff Zebraline, a Super Hornet uh, pilot, uh, and, and his article is called Can Do Is Not Working. And then we've got a piece by longtime proceedings author Barney Rubble, Captain uh, Barney Rubel, um, and, and his article is also about forward presence and how forward presence really needs to be managed in a much more uh, disciplined way, probably at the OSD level, because the, the constant demands from the COCOMs have kind of eaten up the Navy and nobody's ever said no to any of those requests, or it's very rare for a re request for a carrier strike group or an ESG to be turned down. So the, those three articles work very well together. They complement each other nicely. Uh, so, you know, I, I imagine that there's going to be a lot of feedback and a lot of reaction to uh, that package of content, but especially to uh, Secretary Work's article, you know, the slavish devotion to forward presence has nearly wrecked the U.S. Navy. That's that's a headline in itself. Absolutely. And so it's really relevant, these subjects in as the news is breaking at U.S. 9 News of the China being the largest fleet in the world now, numbers wise, China painting targets in the Chinese desert of Ford class carriers and Arleigh Burke destroyers and America class amphibs. So that threat is real and ascendant. And as we start to quibble about defense budgets and forward presence, we're doing so in the face of a rising threat and an existential threat, which kind of feels a lot like 1873, you know, and, and why, uh, Warden gathered the other 14 with and, and created the Naval Institute. You know, it was the same kind of sort of trend where domestically the interest and the budgets were going down, but in the real world, the threat to the homeland was, was going up. So that, at that time, the Spanish Navy, right? The Spanish Navy particularly, um, but there were other European navies that had uh, designs on, uh, you know, stymieing our westward expansion, making sure we couldn't operate with impunity in the literals of the Caribbean and Central America, you know. So uh, obviously uh, history has shown that the founders of the Naval Institute and those principles, the Mahans, the Simses, the Fisks, the, uh, you know, the, the, the insurgents as we call them, um, uh, loose, uh, were prescient, you know, and, and uh, they were right. So that kind of great thinking is happening these days in each and every issue of proceedings as well. So why don't we get to our guest? And for today's episode, we're kind of going a couple months back. Into we are. The, back the to the May Naval Review, issue. back to the May issue, the May 2021 issue. Uh, and the, uh, the author that's joining us today from uh, Brevard, North Carolina, is retired Captain Roger Herbert. He was a U.S. Navy SEAL. Uh, and after retiring from the Navy, he, uh, he taught at the Leadership and Ethics Department here at the U.S. Naval Academy, the Stockdale Center, and uh, back in, in May, he wrote an article for us that's titled Moral Reasoning in Seven Questions, and I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago on the show just after I came back from the Coast Guard Academy where I got to participate in the, uh, the ethics conference up there, and Roger was one of the other speakers, and it was wonderful to, to meet him in person and to hear him give his presentation, and Roger, welcome to the show, and I, I want to ask you to share that sea story that you shared with the Coast Guard Academy cadets, because that was kind of the, 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 as you put it, the thing that got you thinking about more reasoning and about war and ethics and the, the, the constant sort of tug of war between a warrior and, and the, the, the ethical side of things. Um, yeah, well, so, so first, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, Bill. Um, uh, it, it was a pleasure meeting you uh, out there in New London. Uh, it's also a pleasure to talk to uh, your readers and your listeners. Uh, I guess it's also a pleasure to be a guinea pig uh, for, for your foray into, uh, into video interviews. Um, you know, when I, when I talk to uh, midshipmen and cadets, I go into some detail um, ab about what prompted me uh, to create this framework. And it's a, and it is a is a sea story in, in which I'm most definitely not the hero. Um, and, and I do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, first, I, I found that mids and cadets will endure just about anything, um, <laughs> even moral philosophy, uh, if there's a sea story involved. Uh, but but second, and, and, and I guess more important, is I want to impart 
to to my students and and to anyone you know to to the cadets I was talking to there at the Coast Guard Academy, just sort of a sense of urgency. Um, you know, as soon as these folks graduate, <laughs> the, the stakes go way up. Um, some some will have to make no kidding life and death decisions really soon after they accept their commissions. But, you know, even those who, who don't end up in combat roles, everyone will be making decisions um, in which the moral stakes uh, are high uh, decisions in which they could either uh, do, do great harm or, or, or great good. Um, uh, and it's, that's just kind of the nature of military service. Um, so, you know, without going into too much detail, on that C story, because I, you know, I, I do tend to go long on that. You know, the gist is this. So I, as a, um, as a lieutenant during the, the 1989 U.S. invasion of Panama, um, I, I approved a plan um, that if not for the quick thinking of, of one of my awesome first class petty officers, uh, would would very likely have have cost the lives of, of several um, Panamanian non-combatants, and um, and you know to make this this awful experience particularly poignant, um, I, I had to walk through through a room um, uh, that had about a dozen uh, women and children uh, whose lives. Uh, I, I had put at risk uh, and I had put those lives at risk because I had failed to take into account um, all of my moral obligations. I, I was so focused on completing the mission uh, and, and bringing my troops home alive uh, that I, I just utterly disregarded my moral obligations to Panamanian civilians. In fact, it, it just didn't um, enter into my thinking. Um, and, and these are people who had done nothing to forfeit or waive uh, their, their rights not to be harmed. So I really got lucky that night, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, but once the once the operation was over uh, and I and I got back home, uh, I engaged into some serious soul searching. Um, and and to tell you the truth, what I decided was that I I. I just looked in the mirror and I said, I, I think I'm morally unfit uh, for this job. Um, and I decided that I, I needed to, to find a new path in life. Uh, maybe one that didn't involve such a, a high moral degree of difficulty because clearly I had failed. Um, but, uh, but fortunately it was about uh, this time that I, I discovered that, uh, you know, human beings have been, have been thinking about how to fight and win with honor um, and how, how to come home, how to come back from war as whole human, whole persons. Uh, I've been thinking about this for millennia. Um, so I dove into this literature. Um, and, and of course, moral theory can be pretty esoteric. Uh, all of my students will, will tell me that. Um, and when it, and it's in its sort of unrefined state it's it's not terribly useful maybe to someone trying to um, trying to make moral choices at the speed of war um, so you know I set out to distill moral reasoning down to uh, down to a handful of, of questions basic you know basically an execution checklist uh, and, and I started this project in the early 1990s shortly after returning home from from uh, operation just cause uh, but i'm still making edits uh the, the seven question framework uh, that i recently published in in proceedings uh this is just sort of where i am right now with my thinking on this well roger let's go through a few of the the highlights here of the seven questions so number one is is this a routine moral choice or one that warrants deliberate moral reflection Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, that, that the moral universe um, isn't isn't just about contemplating vexing moral dilemmas um, or deciding whether or not to, to, to cheat on a physics exam. Um, in fact, we make we make moral decisions 
um, that we make decisions that have significant moral content um, every day, many times a day, really. Um, when I guess I kind of made a joke in the article about this, when you respond with a pleasant good morning to a shipmate, um, even though you're, you're really not in the mood to be pleasant because you didn't get a good night's sleep the night before and the exo is about to chew you out for something, um, you, you still are pleasant to your shipmates because that's a moral choice. Um, that action, the action of, of saying, hey, good morning, shipmate, uh, reflects a decision to respect the dignity of, of your shipmate. But of course, it, it, you know, it's not really a decision um, as we understand decisions. Um, we, we do the right thing without pondering, you know, what is the right thing to do? Uh, in so many situations, doing the right thing, it has just become a habit. Um, in other words, they've, they've become routine moral choices. Um, and, and we don't have to consult the writings of Immanuel Kant uh, to, to make the, the right moral choice. Um, and we think about it, most of the moral choices we make are like this. Um, by the time that we're adults, uh, most of us have a, a pretty extensive reservoir of, of good moral habits. But, but getting to the question, um, you know, some choices are different. Um, some, some choices uh, warrant deliberate moral reflection. And it's really important that we recognize these uh, when they come our way uh, so that we will, in fact, stop and, and very intentionally um, deliberate, not just make an unreflected decision and, and hope we get it right. So, um, you know, so how do we know? Um, how do we distinguish a routine moral choice from, uh, from situations that warrant deliberate moral reflection? Um, and, and, you know, most of the time we just feel it. Um, and uh, um, it, it, there's this idea that I convey in my article, and I think it's one of the most important ideas in the article, and it doesn't come from me. <laughs> um, during a, a talk at the Naval Academy, um, the philosopher Rushworth Kidder um, brilliantly described this feeling um, as, as crossing the moral thermocline. Uh, by the way, I, I don't know if he's ever like written that down anywhere. He just said it at this conference to to try to uh, I guess to uh, um, to connect to a uh, uh, seafaring people. <laughs> um, so okay, so for a, to to explain this idea a little bit to to uh, for a diver descending in a column of water, um, you know, water doesn't doesn't just gradually get colder as the diver descends. For some reason, it, it's, uh, it gets colder in layers. So the, the water temperature stays relatively constant at first, but then bam, uh, the diver hits the, the thermocline uh, and the water, drop, the water temperature drops precipitously and, and the diver wishes that she had worn a thicker wetsuit. Um, but that line in the water between the warmer layer and the colder layer is invisible. The diver can't see it. She knows she's crossed the moral thermocline just because she feels it. So the same is true uh, for crossing the moral thermocline. Uh, we, we just feel it. We get, um, we get that sort of sick feeling uh, in the pits of our stomach and the hair of, on the back of our neck stands up. Um, so we, learn, we need to learn to, to trust that feeling um, and... and um, when it seems like we've we've crossed the moral thermocline, uh, th then it's time to it's time to to enter into deliberate more reflection. It's time to to turn to question number two. Yeah, Roger. Uh, question number two is how much time do I have? Right. So you could get into that. Is this a is this a decision I have to make in a split second, or is it just a decision I have maybe a couple of days to make? Yeah, I, this is another really hugely important question that we, we overlook. Um, uh, time is a moral factor. Um, and, and sometimes we have the luxury of time and we can conduct a, a thorough moral analysis um, before rendering a decision. But, but often we don't and we have to make we, we have uh, really no choice but to cut short our moral analysis and, and make 
make decisions as best we can with the information that's available. Um, in the military, we're, we're often confronted uh, with tough decisions that you know, we have to make right now. Um, but you know, more, more often than not, I think, uh, we, we have more time for deliberation um, than we think we have. Uh, and too many times, um, a, a false sense of urgency causes us to, to rush to judgment. Um, when, when we really could have benefited from, from gathering more intel, from talking to advisors, um, from, from thinking through long-term consequences of, of the decision we're about to make. Um, you know, it, it, if you have two seconds to make a decision, make a decision in two seconds. Uh, but if you've got two hours, two days, or two weeks, and you're on, you know, you're on the cold side of the moral thermocline, um, you should take that time because the, the, the outcome can, can be huge. Uh, the implications of, of decisions that are made uh, like these uh, can be huge and long lasting. Um, there's a, a I'm, I'm, I'm a big backpacking instructor and, um, and backpacker. And there's a, there's a saying in outdoor education that I love. Um, it's when, whenever you're confronted with a crisis, the first thing you do is you stop, stop the bleeding uh, and then you smoke a cigarette, <laughs> um, a metaphoric cigarette. Those are bad for you, but you, you stop and you smoke a cigarette. The idea is you slow down, you think. You don't make an error, error in moral judgment out of a false sense of urgency. And just asking your question, the question, how much time do I have to make this uh, decision can help prevent that, I think. Well, number three is a good one. Um, and I guess I need a ruling on what's the difference between a moral dilemma and a test of integrity. Yeah, I mean, moral dilemmas, you know, are complex. So, so by definition, uh, a moral dilemma is uh, is a situation in which it's it's unclear um, what the right thing to do is. Um, you know, typically they involve competing moral obligations. Uh, so, for example, um, I can tell the truth, um, or I can be loyal to a friend, but I can't do both. Um, all of my students, young people understand that one very well. Um, I, I can I can choose to be just uh, or I can choose to be merciful, but I can't do both. And, and all of our students learn that one. Uh, the first captain's mass they uh, uh, they participate in um, a test of integrity by contact uh, test of integrity uh, by contrast are, are simple. Um, there's a uh, the, the right and the wrong are clear. Um, I know, I know what the right answer is. I know what the wrong thing to do is. So if I'm breaking the law uh, or I'm violating a widely held norm, then the chances are, are good that I'm confronting a test of integrity. Um, if, if I'm contemplating um, telling a lie, uh, then chances are good that I'm confronting a test of integrity. I mean, sometimes it's right to break a law and sometimes it's right to tell a lie, but typically it's not. So these are good prompts to say, yeah, this is actually just a test of integrity. And, and the reason I think question three is important um, is, is, is that um, the answer is, the answer to question three is going to take you in two very different um, analytical paths. So, so if it's a moral dilemma, I need to skip question four altogether and go right to questions five, six, and seven. Um, you know, if, however, I, I decide, yes, no, this is just a test or not just a test of integrity. You should be careful with that. This is because they're hard. This is a test of integrity um, rather than a moral dilemma. Um, since I already know, you know, I already know what the right thing to do is. Um, then I only have one more question to confront, and that's question number four. You know, do I have the judgment um, and, and the strength of character to do the right thing? Um, and, and, you know, question four is, is, is simple, um, but it's not easy. So moral temptation is real. Um, I, I think about uh, Lieutenant Murphy uh, in the lone survivor story, um, the temptation just just to, to kill those goat herds, um, you know, it had to be powerful. 
Um, uh, he, he knew Murphy knew that letting them go would put at risk uh, his own life and the lives of, of the seals he commanded. Um, but he also knew that killing um, that, that killing helpless non-combatants would, you know, that'd be murder. Um, so Lieutenant Murphy did the right thing and we celebrate his, his decision. He was, uh, he was awarded the medal of honor. Um, uh, but he and two members of his reconnaissance team also paid the ultimate price. So again, uh, when you get to question four, you know, it's, uh, it, it's simple. Um, but it's, it's definitely not easy. We often fail tests of integrity. I don't know anybody who has not. Um, and, and, you know, as I look at the, at the lone survivor case, I, I often wonder what I would have done. Would I have possessed the courage, uh, to make the decision that, that, uh, Mike Murphy made. And then question five is what do I owe others? So talk about that for a bit. Yeah. Uh, so actually now, okay. So if I'm now in the realm, I've decided that no, this, no kidding. Um, is, I'm confronting, no kidding, a, te a, a I'm sorry, a, a moral dilemma. Uh, this isn't a test of integrity. I don't know what the right thing to do is. Um, so when I'm here, this is when I pull out questions five, six, and seven together and in, in, in sequence. Um, so, so first uh, question five, you know, what do I owe to others? Um, this is this is actually really a two part question, um, but I didn't want to make two questions, but it's a two part question. So the first part is, what do I owe to others uh, because of my duty to respect other humans as humans? Um, now, this is kind of unsettled philosophy. Uh, you know, the fact that humans have rights just because they are human, um, it's not universally accepted. Um, but, but most Western thinkers embrace this. Um, and, and we certainly embrace it in the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, now the extent of those rights um, is, is debatable. Um, but it's, it's widely accepted that, that humans have the right not to be physically harmed, not to be incarcerated without cause, not to be enslaved, um, not, not to have our stuff stolen from us. Um, so a person can waive or forfeit those rights, you know, through their actions or through their choices. Um, but, but unless they do so, then those rights impose duties on the rest of us to respect their life, liberty, and property. And, and I think this is the essence of, of my failure, my personal failure in Panama. Um, I, I failed to properly take into account um, those inalienable rights of, of every Panamanian uh, combatant. Um, so that's the first part. That, those are my general obligations. Um, but I also sometimes take on special obligations. So the second part of question five uh, is what do I owe to others because of, of particular roles uh, uh, and, uh, and relationships I have or, or because of promise I, as I, promises I've made. So, uh, so if, if I'm a fireman or, or a cop, um, I have, I've taken on special moral obligations that others don't have. Um, others, others are expected to run out of a burning building. A fireman is expected to run into it. Um, if, if I'm a father, I have special more obligations to care for and feed my children um, that others don't don't necessarily have. Um, if you're a military commander, you, you've got special obligations, right, to your crew, to, to your mission. Absolutely. So you have, yes, and, and both. You have, you have obligations to your mission. You have obligations uh, to your troops. Um, and, and you also have, have obligations to the American people. Um, you made a promise to them to support and defend the Constitution. Uh, so once again, um, those of us who've done that, um, uh, we, are, we have a moral obligation to run to the sound of the guns when, when prudence would dictate running in the other direction. Moving on to question number six is what are the foreseeable consequences? Yeah, yeah, and and I mean let's let's face it, Bill. Um, how how many fit reps did you receive uh, that said, well, he had good intentions? <laughs> 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 probably not many. Um, and if it, if it, if you did, then it probably wasn't a great fit rep. <laughs> um, 
I mean, we're results oriented people, right? We, we look at the outcomes. Uh, but, but I, question six is a little bit like, like, um, question four. So it's real simple. Um, Hey man, what are the outcomes? What, what do I imagine? What are the foreseeable outcomes here? Uh, but it's not easy because if we're serious uh, about moral reasoning, then we have to dig deep. Um, we, at the Naval Academy, we teach, we, we really, the, the, our week that we focus on consequences, we, um, uh, we draw on the utilitarian theories of uh, Jeremy Bentham and, and John Stuart Mill, and these were no dummies. Um, so it's not just about looking at the consequences. It's about looking at, at you know, what are the net goods and harms that my actions are, are putting out into the universe? And not just the short-term consequences, but also the long-term consequences. And, and, and you know, a good way of, of trying to trying to account for those long-term consequences is to, is to ask that question, you know, okay, what sort of, um, what sort of precedent does my action, is, does my action set? E even if nobody sees it, if they did see it, what sort of precedent would my action set? So a good consequentialist thinker really thinks deep about question six. So getting back to the Michael Murphy example in, in, in combat right in Afghanistan. So if, if he and his, squad of seals if they had killed the the goat herd and and you know the, the, the three or, was it three or four goat herds that had stumbled upon them would anybody have known would anybody have known what the cons you know exactly what happened there uh and i think the answer uh to i mean to to, to what you just said right it's what what, it, what the universe might know right so the, the afghan people might not have actually known what happened and how those how those uh goat herds were killed but Murphy would have known, his men would have known, that word would have gotten out at least through the, the, the SEAL community and, and you know, the, the, the moral universe to some extent, you know, whether you call that karma, whatever you want to call it, right, there would have been some sort of a reckoning there. Yeah, I, and, and I mean, these are good, these are good human beings. Um, all, all four of those men are, are terrific. I, I knew one, Danny Dietz, pretty well. He uh, he served under me at, at my my uh, 05 command, um, and and so these are good people. And um, so even if that story never went beyond those four people, um, then uh, I will I will ima I can imagine uh, that there would have been severe harm done anyway. Um, and if you want to look at the consequences, you can think about um, about the moral injury to all four of those people who, again, are good human beings. And, and no one can execute uh, an unarmed person. I mean, even if they were yeah, Taliban and, and had Osama bin Laden tattoos on their foreheads and had bandoliers around their necks, they were prisoners. Um, and we had a moral obligation to them. And, and the actual act of executing someone who was helpless, none of them could have lived well with that. And that also goes to, you know, uh, we as officers, and, and again, putting myself in Mike Murphy's uh, position, we as officers have an obligation to do everything we can to bring our troops home um, uh, you know, alive, you know, in an upright position with a pulse. Um, but, but we also have an obligation to bring them home as full human beings and, and asking our troops to do something that is morally repugnant, um, like executing somebody unarmed. Um, uh, it, it is unlikely that any of them would have come home unharmed from that. So that's yeah. a really good point. Bill. That, that, that is a, I think a critical point. And, and I, I watched the cadets while you were giving this presentation up in New London, and you made that point. And I, I remember thinking that's a, a particularly poignant part of your uh, of your discussion. And I watched the cadets as they were sort of chewing on that mentally, and and you could see the heads going up and down and thinking about that. It's not just about bringing everybody back with, you know. 10 digits, you know, or, or, you know, 10 fingers and 10 toes and, you know, the ability to walk for the rest of their life and, you know, but also to bring them back where the headspace between their ears yeah. is, uh, is a place where they can live for the next 10, 15, 30 years, whatever it is in their, in their, you know, post-service life. That's a really important point, I think. 
Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely, Bill. And and you know, the, the this is something I think that I, I hope I'm glad to hear that the cadets maybe took that on well because um, this is something they really need to think about uh, when when they're warm and they're dry and they're safe and they got a roof over their heads. Um, so it's easy for us to say, um, you know, hey, Mike Murphy made the right decision. You know, end of story. That's really hard. Um, and especially, in, and time was pressing in on him. And he's in awful, cold, brutal weather. And and fear is is got to be there in all these. Nobody's fearless. So, um, so to be able to think about those things now um, is important. And conveying them to your troops, I think, can be really hard. Um, it's like, you know, what do you mean I'm going to put, take excess risk onto myself so that I can save these people, these non-combatants who hate my guts. I mean, non-combatants, we call them innocents. Um, I, you know, nobody's innocent. <laughs> and, and these guys, you know, they, they hate you. They would love to see you dead. And, um, um, and so, yeah, to, to, to try to have to explain that to your troops, that's also really difficult. So working through these things, I mean, and this is why we have, um, you know, the course I ran at the Naval Academy uh, and, and, and similar courses at all the other uh, service academies and the ethics forum that you know, at the Coast Guard Academy that you and I attended. This is why we have all these things to think through them now, because daggone it, this can be really hard to think about when you're when you're cold and tired and wet and, and afraid. So, yeah. So the the seventh question in your construct is what would a good person do? And this reminds me of when I was teaching the ethics course at the academy and some of my former squadron mates found out about it. They're like, hold on, let me get this straight. You're teaching ethics. Like this proves that those who can't teach, those who can do. Um, so and I should say that joke to my students as well. So what's that about? What yeah. would a good person do, Roger? Yeah. Um, so this is this captures, um, as as you both know, this captures Aristotelian virtue ethics, which is pretty dense stuff. Um, but, you know, I think you can I think you can bring it down to something that that's very useful. Um, you, you know, I I argue that every decision that we make on the cold side of the moral thermocline will have some bearing on our character. Um, uh, so, so, uh, when we make good choices, our character is enhanced and, and, and the chances are, it's like exercising a muscle. The chances are going to be good that we can make a, a good choice again the next time. But when we make poor choices, uh, it, the opposite happens. Our character is degraded if only just a little bit. Um, and chances are that we're going to make more poor choices in, in the future. Um, uh, so that's one way of looking at, at question seven is, is, you know, what is the impact of this on my character? Um, and the other way is, is really the way you're talking about, uh, which, which I love it. It's a shortcut to a lot of, a lot of other uh, ways of thinking through moral reasoning. Um, and, and that is to thinking, uh, uh, I, I asked my students to think about someone who, who they believe is a person of excellent character. Um, and, and for some of my students, uh, their, their moral exemplar is, is Jesus or, or Muhammad. Uh, most of them it's, you know, it's mom or dad. Um, and, and then I suggest that anytime they're confronted with a moral dilemma, uh, or a test of integrity, um, just ask themselves, what would that person do, you know, in this situation? Um, you know, what would Jesus do? What would Muhammad do? Um, what would what would mom or dad do? Um, what what would Wonder Woman do if that's your moral exemplar? Uh, and and you know if you answer that question and and act accordingly, then then chances are really good that you're gonna do the right thing. In in the article, uh, I, I want to read this because I, it's a good point. You 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 brought up you know. Aristotle there a minute ago, and you, you mentioned Kant, and I know those are uh, that's that's some thick reading for most people, uh, but it's also present those those exemplars are in, in many other places, and so you use 
uh, you know, Aristotle's Nic uh, Nic Nicomachean Ethics, but also the novels of J.R.O. Tolkien, John Steinbeck, H Herman Wauk, you know, movies like Remember the Titans, Empire Strikes Back, even just conversations with your mom and dad or your grandparents, right? Uh, that, that examples are there, no matter almost where we look for them. And uh, uh, you, you don't have to necessarily read Kant and Aristotle, although I'm, you know, I'm sure it's like taking, taking your medicine, it's a good thing to do at some point in your life. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> uh, Kant in particular, I, I remember the first time I taught uh, Kant, I was at University of Virginia, and I figured that was that was it. As I walked into my classroom, I said, they're going to decide, they're going to determine that I'm a phony because um, <laughs> I only barely got him. And um, and what I as it turns out, like nobody quite gets Kant. He's pretty tough. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I mean, there's just so many resources out there. Um, I, I mean, if you want to understand the virtue, I talk about Steinbeck. I love Steinbeck. If you want to talk about the virtue of um of loyalty you know i say go read of mice and men you know mm -hmm. you're going to learn more about loyalty than you could in in reading any volumes of of uh, of aristotle's uh, take on this so uh so yeah the, the the opportunities to to learn ethics the opportunities to watch other people work through moral dilemmas they're all over the place but we have to be intentional when we do it we have to think about this these things um, you know, when we're confronted with a moral dilemma on, you know, on, on a TV show, I don't know, work through the seven questions, you know, use it as a case study. Anyway, I mean, so so great literature often does involve uh, moral dilemmas. And these are opportunities for us to, to exercise our muscles. Um, uh, and the more we can do that, the more we can can move through these. I mean, even seven questions, that's hard to do when things are, are happening to you fast. But the more you can exercise them, I think the, the better off we are. Absolutely. I, I, I also um, I, I told my staff I was so uh, impressed and moved by that whole conference up at the Coast Guard Academy. And, and for the record, I, I was not asked because I'm some sort of expert in ethics uh, I was there really just to talk about professional writing and speaking truth to power and how things like proceedings and, uh, you know, writing can help your career, but also how to do it, uh, and hopefully in, a, in, in an ethical way. Uh, and I just got, I think I got way more out of the day than I than I put into it. That's for certain. <laughs> but, but one of the things as as an editor and you know, and I just mentioned the December issue of proceedings and trying to fit things together so that they complement that that uh, one piece of content, you know, plays off of another. And um, one of the things I really appreciated about that day was several of the themes that kind of strung throughout the day, you were the opening speaker. Uh, and so you're talking about moral reasoning and your, your, your examples, but then uh, at the end of the day was another Navy SEAL combat veteran, wounded warrior, uh, Jason Redmond's and, and his story is is uh, unbelievable. It, it is it was so inspiring, and he does the presentation so well. But a huge part of it was the story arc of, you know, not just being a SEAL and and being a guy in combat, but also uh, how he he made mistakes, and then how others other leaders helped him come back from those mistakes, helped him regain his 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 moral authority, the authority of his men. Uh, the authority within his own family, and and to be rehabilitated, uh, not just physically, but also kind of between his ears as well. I, I thought I thought that just it just the whole theme of the day played out so well in in those terms, and and I and it was another one of those things where the the cadets and I spoke to a bunch of them afterwards, and some of them mentioned that how different speakers had touched on things that all kind of wrapped together. So my question to you sorry for that long lead in is, um, you know, to that, that, you know, we're, we're all mistakes. We're all human beings. We're, you know, it, even if we have that mindset of, you know, what would Jesus do? What would grandpa do? What would Muhammad do? And we fail. How, how do you get back from that? Yeah. Um, so we have to be able to forgive ourselves. Um, and da David Lubin, He's a, um, a philosopher at Georgetown. 
um, uh, wrote a paper and daggone it, it's a, the title is awesome and I'm forgetting it right now. Um, but uh, uh, he, he, he talked about this. And typically, you know, we have our, our set of values, you know, our character is this bag of values. And typically our values and our, and our actions line up. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we have those failures and they don't line up. These are my values, but I did this. And we have, um, uh, we, we experience what Lubin calls, I mean, this is a psychological term, cognitive dissonance. You can't have two, two of us. There's got to be one. We're going to have to bring those in line. And what he says is that most of us do this. We'll bring our values down to meet our actions will be degraded, will allow ourselves to become morally degraded, either through rationalization or, or and, and typically we're not even thinking about it. The answer is when this happens, um, we have to do the opposite. We have to make sure that that never happens again. And that requires hard work. Um, uh, you know, if, if I cheated on an exam, the hard work would be to, to getting myself right would be going to my professor and telling them that mm -hmm. that's not easy. If I, if I was impolite, the hard work would be to go and apology, apologize. Maybe that's not easy work, but that's how we need to, to get back on our, our feet um, is to recognize um, that, that, um, that what we, that our action was inconsistent with our values uh, and to, to bring that back online. Um, and, and then ultimately, we do need to forgive ourselves. We do need to, to recognize that we are human beings and we do have failures. Um, and, um, you know, I personally have had many, many uh, failures. And I've, I've failed many tests of integrity. I'll probably will again. The, you know, the answer is how do you recover from that? Um, you need to feel sick to your stomach um, and, and uh, it, it needs to hit hard, but then you need to do the work and, and then ultimately um, forgive yourself. I, I can't imagine that we'll, uh, you know, improve on that point. That is just a wonderful way to wrap this up. It's been a great conversation. Our guest today has been Captain Roger Herbert. He's a retired U.S. Navy captain. He was a Navy SEAL, commanded at multiple levels during his career and his article is in the May issue of Proceedings. It is titled Moral Reasoning in Seven Questions. It starts on pages 56 and 57. Roger, thanks for, um, for writing for us. Thanks for being on the show and previews of coming attractions. I think it's going to be in the January issue of Proceedings. We have another one of your, uh, of your articles, and uh, it's, it's also it's, it's equally fantastic. So uh, stay tuned for that one. Well, Bill and, and Ward, thank you again for the invitation. It really was a pleasure. And thanks for being our first video guest. Yeah, I think you may have, that, <laughs> that, may have been a lapse, that may have been a lapse of judgment in you. No, 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 you did great. I did. Thanks, great. Roger. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, that'll wrap up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast and the first episode of the Proceedings Videocast. Uh, until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. This episode has been brought to you by the members of the U.S. Naval Institute. For more, go to usni.org slash join.